Morning. There's a short message I was uh, asked to convey about uh, this evening's plans. Uh, I believe you all know very well Walter Brown from yesterday. Uh, message is as follows. We, using video ex excerpts and short movies, Walter Bra Brown will take us on a journey exploring and celebrating the programming profession, allowing us to reflect on where we've come from and what is that makes our profession great. Uh, not to be missed, today at 6.30 p.m. I know I'll be there. <coughs> Juan? Okay, so, uh, sorry for the uh, late start. At least we've all had some extra time to uh, get even more awake, I hope. Uh, so, welcome to my exploration of the C++ fringe where the uncalled for happens anyway, or in our case, where uncalled code happens anyway. Do you need a minute to, to understand what you're seeing here? No one is calling F. So, <coughs> uh, first of all, a short disclaimer. This isn't another talk about loggers. There's pl been plenty of those and also plenty of loggers. It is about uh, an application which is very useful for logging and has to do with a special way of handling uh, logger payloads. But I'm sure it can also be uh, put to other good uses. So I won't be showing you how to do your file I.O. And also because you were short on time, I, I will show you a very simplistic case and not a full-blown logger with uh, par parameters and so on. <coughs> Unless someone gives me more time on some other conference maybe. So as I said, what I will be showing you is how to handle obfuscate. Hmm? I will be showing you how to handle obfuscated log messages. By obfuscated, I mean obfuscated inside the uh, uh, shipped binary. That's the main focus here. And how to retrieve those messages without requiring any pre-processing uh, via a tool which I wrote uh, in C++17. Uh, I called it Duon init. This uh, utility is instrumental for uh, this whole thing. So a short introduction. Uh, my name is Andrei Zissou. Uh, I'm an Israeli C++ programmer. I've been in this uh, business for uh, more than two decades by now in several areas, including mobile, cyber, multimedia, more areas. I especially love those times where I need to do something on the fringe and I have, I've had some chances, for example, when I worked in uh, uh, API hooking, DLL injection, hooked Microsoft Office, that was fun. Uh, I've recently joined uh, the Israeli national body, WG21, and I intend to pursue my interest in reflection after we're done with the conferences. I am working at a uh, remote telemedicine startup called Binai AI. We are doing some interesting stuff. We uh, support various vital signs, uh, including simple stuff such as blood pressure, heart rate, uh, breathing rate, and more uh, complicated stuff uh, such as uh, oxygen saturation, good for COVID, sympathetic stress, and more coming all the time. We are able to run on several platforms, including iOS, Web SDK, Android. We'll have Windows soon. Uh, and we have an SDK which is easy to integrate with uh, third parties. <coughs> so, back to the beginning. This was just about six months ago. Uh, as previously mentioned, I was asked to remove sensitive log strings from our binaries. Uh, no, I'm lying. It's not simple. <coughs> so here's the problem. It's a very simple way of seeing it. So let's say you have, in this case, I'm printing two logs. You can see where I'm checking the password. You can see where I'm checking the license. We don't really want to make uh, life too easy for hackers. So we wouldn't want these strings to show up in our binary. Uh, and as we can see, these strings do show up here, as expected. So how are we going to do this? And as I said, I needed to do this in C17. 
Uh, well, goes without saying, we need to replace those strings with something else. Now, what is that something else going to be? We could have an encrypted string that's probably doable. It's not very easy. You could use one of the uh, string handling uh, libraries in the boost, perhaps. Uh, that probably wouldn't be very readable code. And let's just say it didn't go there. And just mind you, I need to do this at compile time. That's why it's not so easy. Uh, so let's go for some numerical presentation. What do we mean by that? Usually, uh, when we would be mentioning something like this with uh, prior art, uh, that would involve some, uh, some enum. You would have a, a huge enum with one entry per each log type you have. In our case, we have over 200 of those. Good luck setting this up up front. Good, even more good luck maintaining this later on and with all the mistakes uh, you're going to make unless you're not really human. Uh, so how can we automate this? Uh, the one thing that ha uh, comes to mind is hashing. Uh, calculate a hash value for each of those strings. Now we have several advantages and several drawbacks. Uh, we have one ad ad um, perhaps slight advantage for security. Uh, is that the uh, hash size is always the same size, so you can't guess the string you started off with. And you also get a smaller binary uh, in most cases, because uh, usually, on average, those strings are going to be longer than a 64-bit hash. Uh, and it's very easy to find a, uh, any function online. It just has to be const expert uh, that works on C++17 and, and, this ha and, and uh, is able to hash a string at uh, compile time. Uh, the drawbacks, obviously, those are hashes. Hashes are one way, so you can't reverse the process. And uh, hashes may have hash collisions. Now, those may be highly unlikely with a code function. With the one I'm using, I've yet to encounter such a collision. And I don't really care about them anyway, because, since you'll, uh, as you'll see, I'm collecting all those logs and I will automatically detect, I'm guaranteed to detect any such hash and I can just swap the, uh, the hash key. Okay, so let's start with the uh, easy part, our production code. This is a function I found online, not very fancy. Uh, it has to be const expert, has to have a, some kind of string as input. I've also added a parameter for the uh, hash seed and it returns a size t as in a 64-bit uh, hash result. I just tweaked it a little bit and I've wrapped it in a logger mapper. One thing important to say here is that everything I'm going to show you requires macros. Maybe one day we'll be able to do this with uh, reflection. So I have my macro on the last line here. It's um, calling the hash function and outputting the result. And the, uh, we have the output here as expected. Now we're not uh, printing uh, text strings, we are printing hashes. Okay, that was really easy. Okay, just one small verification. Let's make sure we really got rid of those strings. And we haven't. A const expert function may be const evaluated as in running at compile time, but depending on context, if it's runnable at runtime, it may actually run at runtime. The compiler chose to run it at runtime, therefore it's using those strings at runtime and we still have the mission not accomplished. So we need to force a const evaluation. Uh, luckily this is quite easy, just one more line. I took the standard integral constant template, instantiated it with the result of my expression, which returns the hash of the string. And here we go. This will now have to happen at compile time. And here we are. I'm looking for the incriminated text inside the binary. No results. Not finding it. That's it. Mission accomplished. We can all go home. Thank you for being here. Just kidding. So, we got rid of the log strings, but we also got rid of the log strings, and we want to read those logs. So
So what are we going to do about it? So now this is the real fun. Uh, what I'm going to show you from now on, um, <clears throat> just in general, I worked on this probably back in March. I took probably more or less a day to write the first part, which I showed you now. And then I decided, let's take a day. Let's see if I can somehow do this without uh, any pre-processing tool. I didn't really feel like, uh, I don't know, writing some uh, parser in Python or whatever. And that was a very fun Thursday with some uh, back and forth with the uh, Israeli C++ WhatsApp group. And by the end of the day, uh, I had concluded that I've managed to pull that uh, ban of the, the rabbit of the head, however you say that. And that I may actually attend some conferences this year, all in the same day. <coughs> uh, so. What's our starting point here? We don't have the original strings. Hashes are one way only. Therefore, production code cannot access original strings for either reading them or preparing an offline dictionary or whatever. We don't have the original strings, period. We do need, obviously, a special a separate decoding tool, which is going to open the obfuscated encoded logs and uh, come up with the original strings. Where do we still have the original strings? Obviously, in the source code. So how do we uh, design this, uh, this decoder tool? Uh, we need to decide, let's say that the decoder can somehow gain access to the original strings. Uh, what is it going to do with them? As uh, previously mentioned, a, as a, and as you all know, const expert function can also run at runtime. This time, we do want them to run at runtime. We want the decoder tool, as it starts up, to run the hashes on all the log strings, and uh, prepare a uh, global map to, to map hashes to the strings. Now comes the tricky part. How do we get those uh, strings? As I said, we need macros. So the assumption here is that we, we are doing all our uh, logging via a set of macros. In this demo, there's a single macro, which I've called log, very imaginative. Uh, <coughs> Uh, we do, however, have a problem. Uh, even if this were production code and definitely in the decoder tool, we are not actually expected to invoke the code that produces those logs. So how are we going to collect them and all of them? <coughs> what would we, ne we need in order to be able to do this? We will need to be able to collect all the strings from uh, uh, places which are not being invoked uh, before we start doing anything else such as parsing log files. So how could we do that? <coughs> so this uh, boils down to the question, how do you do something automatically in C++? Uh, the one mechanism we have in C++ for doing something automatically is called constructors. Now constructors of what? We could have global objects. But this is an immediate, immediate no-go because we are talking about local scopes and you can't define a, a global object in a local scope. That's pretty obvious. So the other option we have is static data members. And we do know we have those. We need uh, the, the class whose static data members we're going to be dealing with to be local classes. Luckily, we also have those. In most cases, these are known as lambdas. But as you know, lambdas are only syntactic sugar for local classes. So let's have a go at it. <coughs> so this is the first attempt. As you can see, I have the function. I've defined a uh, struct, as which, as we all know, is the same as a class. It has a nested class, and it's holding a uh, static instance of the nested class, and we want the uh, constructor of the nested class to be invoked. And it's going to do something nice, such as printing its own line number. <coughs> and this is our first problem. The language doesn't support static data members in local classes. Not good. So <coughs> if local classes can have static data members, who can? Template classes. Now, how would this be useful? Template class is not a local class. But 
we could attempt to instantiate it locally, which is what I'm doing here. So now we have the init exec class. Its template parameter is a size t, which is meant to represent a line number. We have the constructor as seen be, you know, we've seen before. And I'm instantiating it in on line 16. Are you seeing uh, this uh, all right with the lighting? OK, <clears throat> let's see if this works. Managed to build it. Will this also run? Nope. Oh, come on, what did you expect? I'm not calling this code. So obviously, the optimizer is going to have a field day. So how do we force the optimizer's hand? Uh, well, obviously, we need to do something that an optimizer doesn't feel free to optimize away. And as we've just seen, an unused template instantiation won't do. So what will a side effect? For now, let's print this. What exactly am I printing? I'm printing the address of the static data members. So this is what we would call an ODR use, and it should force an instantiation of the template. This looks bad. It's actually good. This is a linker error, which means we've passed the compilation phase. Um, this is probably not new to you. This is a static data member, so we need to provide a uh, definition. This is how you do it the old way. There's also a new way, which I refer to later, which is uh, via an inline uh, definition. And I, I might be missing up, messing up definitions and declarations. I also always mix those two. OK, so now we're in business, and it actually works. And now we can also attempt to get rid of the ugly side effect. We can just cast it to avoid. And it also does, does the trick. Now it's much neater than it was. So let's sum it up. <coughs> we have managed to produce a side effect from code that no one is calling. The way we've done it is via a uh, template class, which has a nested class, which it holds a static member of. And we are instantiating the template class in our local context. And this part works. However, we're not quite there yet because we've just, we haven't actually managed to create, to execute in this way any custom action. We have taken a local step. The line number that we're printing now, let's go back, it's not the line number of this constructor. It's the line number conveyed from here. So this is a small piece of state which we've managed to pass from our local context. Can we do the full job? Uh, another name for, for any custom action in C++, previously mentioned, is of course lambdas. So instead of the line number, can we pass a lambda? So how do we pass a lambda? If it were a normal, let's say, template function, we would have, or even a class, template class with CTAD, we would pass a parameter. But this is a static member. It, the nested class can only have a default constructor, so we need to keep passing the lambda as a template parameter. Uh, <coughs> okay, so we are going to try to pass the lambda in a naive uh, way as a non type template parameter in TTP, and it doesn't work as you can see. This is the point where I was pretty close to giving up, and then I went on the internet and found this solution. <coughs> Can you still hear me? Yeah. OK, so let's break this down. <coughs> we have a prototype of a void void function. We are using this type as non-type template parameter. Now here's the real crucial part. We are taking the lambda and assigning it to a const expert function, 
member function, uh, sorry, function pointer. And this is what we are instantiating the uh, template with on line uh, 23. And now it works. <coughs> so what has been achieved so far? We have custom code executed during the global init sequence from a non-invoked context in C++17. It won't work before C++17. Now a quick word about this. Uh, before C++17, uh, you wouldn't be able to do this part. Uh, the compiler would be complaining about assigning a lambda to a const text per function or something like this. Uh, it might have once made sense because the lambda code is obviously not const text per, but we shouldn't really care if you think about it because the pointer itself can be and is. So in C++17 it works, mostly, depending on which compiler. We'll talk about this later. And now we have Duon in it, our promised utility. Uh, this slide has everything you've seen so far, except that the code that I used to have in a local function is now in, in a two-line macro. Okay. And now I can keep my promise. And you know now how Duon in it works and how this piece of code works. And this is a contribution I, uh, I got. It appears this is even easier in C++20. Uh, so far that I have probably managed to almost double the font size on this slide. This is all it takes to do it in C++20. <coughs> and another word about the inline uh, bit. This is supported in C++17. If it works for you, it's great. When I first worked on this in our, on our production code, I was using uh, Visual Studio 2019. I found for some no idea why reason, when I switched to inline static, it crashed during execution. So I didn't really have motivation to uh, research it. I just came back to the old way. Questions? Okay, and all is clear. So let's put this all together. We have Duon in it. Uh, we started with uh, compile time substitution of strings with their hashes, and now we need to get those back. So we need to build the decoder tool. We don't have the original strings. The, whole, the source code has them. And we have the log macros. Now, since they are macros, we can provide an uh, additional implementation for them, which will be used in the decoder tool. What are we going to do there? We are going to map the strings. We are going to calculate their hashes and map them back each to their original string. When do we do that? Before everything else. And you, I'm sure, already know how we're going to do that. So how do we design this? For simplicity's sake, I'm using a single compile time uh, configuration uh, flag. Uh, I call it build for encoding. If it's on, we're in production code and we are doing string substitution, obfuscation, however you'll call it. And if it's off, we are supporting decoding and we are using Duon in it to, for the uh, log string registration. And once we're done with that, we're free to parse our log files and, uh, and uh, retrieve the original strings. <coughs> uh, as previously mentioned, I'm go not going to discuss uh, file I/O log parameters and any such stuff. So let's start. We have our uh, two-state macro. This is, in our case, production code. And this is going to be our decoder. <coughs> Let's go into the decoder now. This is the registration uh, code. It's pretty straightforward, just a few things that I do need to say about it. First of all, on the first line, we have the global map. It maps size t, which are the hashes, uh, back to the original strings. We can afford to represent the original strings as uh, const char pointers because they are hard-coded strings. They have uh, uh, global lifetime. 
<coughs> we need to refer to the global map in a lazy manner because we are going to do this inside global constructors and we can control the static initialization order. And the assert here, obviously an assert will only compile in debug builds, but this is our safety net that I've previously mentioned. Uh, every time we register a log message, and we're going to register all of them, we are making sure that if we do have a duplicate uh, hash key, it represents uh, the same string. Otherwise, it's a hash collision. So we are checking the hash, of course. Then we are trying to compare uh, the string pointers. In, in case the compiler does string pooling, this will be enough. In case it doesn't, we have here a full uh, string comparison. Now let's put it to a test. So we have test code. It, it's able to do two things. It's either encoding and invoking the function and producing the logs or it's decoding and it's not invoking the functions and I've put in two hashes which I created by running this the first time for encoding and I, get, I got uh, two hash values. Now I'm commenting this line out and now we get original strings and to put this all in context what I've just shown you is this. this two hash values manage to be turned back into the original strings which are defined here but I didn't call f from anywhere and yet I have them. The call stack here is something quite nice to look at. Uh, first of all you can see here dynamic initializer. This is the global in a sequence in Visual Studio. Uh, I've put a breakpoint on the registration function. Uh, you can see here the log that I'm currently, uh, the log text that I'm currently registering. If we go up the call stack, we can see where it's actually being located. Now, this looks a bit a bit, it, it might take you a, a minute to understand what you're actually seeing here. It appears as if F is being called, which would make me a liar, but uh, I haven't lied, at least not today so far. And you can see here, this is a lambda. F is not being invoked. The lambda created by the macro on line 88 is. Further up the call stack, we can see our nested class constructor. And even further up, we can see the, uh, what is in fact a global object that is being uh, created here. Any questions? OK. <coughs> so, oh, sorry. <coughs> uh, how this all came about. Uh, first of all, the requirement that I was given is something, uh, I think it's not really an everyday requirement. There are many cases where uh, there is a need for logger, uh, in, um, encryption, obfuscation, whatever, but that usually refers to the log files itself. It's perhaps a little less often that we need to get rid of uh, log strings inside uh, the shipped binaries. Uh, one thing I didn't know is what I just told you, that it, this wouldn't have been possible in C++14, but just happened to become just possible in C++17. Uh, I didn't know the bit about uh, static data members. I discovered it as I uh, went along. Basically, I didn't know this should, that this should be impossible, which is a good place to start with. And now... <coughs> about the uh, additional compilers. Uh, as I was working on this, I was working on uh, Visual Studio. And as I started to prepare uh, this presentation, I went to see what's going on with the GCC and Clang. And GCC here is in a really bad shape. GCC won't compile this code. 
Now, when I presented this at the uh, Core C++ Meetup last month, I had a guy in the audience, Alexander Weissman, which is uh, very clearly much crazier than I am. And he managed to come up with this code, which allows GCC to work. Now, this is crazy. Instead of an NTTP is passing the lambda as, as a uh, bytes class type, that's the uh, sane part. Uh, the problem is that you can't then instantiate an instance of the lambda and call it. So what this guy did, he just took the number one, casted it forcefully to a pointer to the lambda and called it, and this works. As I said, this is crazy. And this, soon we'll, you'll see this guy's name again. <coughs> uh, first of all, why GCC doesn't work? Because for the last probably more or less fa uh, four years, it has a bug which has yet to be fixed. Uh, it was explained by Joshua Lee on Stack Overflow. In uh, general, what it says is that uh, in GCC, you, uh, there's no problem uh, assigning any normal function to global functions, for example, uh, to a const expert function pointer, just not lambdas. Even though this is a stateless lambda, which should just work, it's the same basically as any uh, global function. Now to Clang. For a long time un until last month's meeting, I was blaming Clang for being unreasonable and didn't notice I was the unreasonable one. Uh, what I found out while preparing the presentation is that uh, trying to build a, an early version of the demo, uh, I was getting a seg fault. And then Alexander noted that I was plain stupid. Uh, I told you we need to be careful doing the init sequence. You have the order uh, initialization fiasco and See how it is an object. And you don't control where it's being uh, constructed. If you substitute this with printf, it works just fine. So <coughs> to recap, we are using in production code uh, a constext per hash function to obfuscate our log messages. For this purpose, the instrumental part is the do on init uh, utility. Its implementation works by uh, providing a uh, const expert function pointer, which is our custom action, to a uh, template class as non type template parameter, which is then being executed inside the template class via the constructor of a nested class which is being stored as a static data member. Uh, all this is invoked automatically during uh, the construction of the nested class. We just need to force it, as we've seen, to fool the uh, optimizer. We instantiate the template class with a local lambda. And then we use all of this to create a global dictionary of uh, hash values to original uh, log strings. Now, in terms of costs and other, uh, first of all, general analysis. Uh, I would say be careful with this right now in production code. I've shown you several edge cases. I'm not sure how trustworthy it is. Lucky for us, though, the decoder tool is not production code. It accompanies production code, but the actual production code is only the context per hashing, and it, there's nothing really special about it. We've seen the compiler issues, especially GCC. I haven't checked any other compilers than those three. There was some comment, someone uh, asked maybe there could be some undefined behavior hidden here somewhere. Uh, haven't found any, maybe someone else will. I'd give it some time just in case. Great for tools. 
We do require macros, at least un until we get uh, reflection, hopefully. And you saw the uh, see out uh, horror story. Need to be careful with this. It kind of reminds me uh, loader lock stories and things like that that you need to be careful with and all sorts of uh, initialization scenarios. In terms of performance, memory footprint, haven't found any real issues. Uh, I must say we have 200 plus logs, maybe some other code bases have thousands of them. I haven't measured uh, there, but I can say our decoder tool is blinking fast uh, and it's in its sequence. Uh, production code may actually uh, benefit, uh, at least in terms of uh, code size. Uh, since hash values are typically smaller than uh, full strings. There is one case where we, you might have some performers, um, for performance costs since uh, hashes are uh, numbers, not strings, and you may have a logger which requires a string, so you may need at runtime in production code to convert the hash back to a string. Even if that's the case, it's easy inside the uh, logger macro implementation uh, to implement, implement uh, caching with a uh, local uh, static object since these are hard-coded strings, so it's perfectly fine to, uh, to cache their, uh, their uh, hash result across, across invocations. Uh, build times, I haven't seen any uh, any uh, impact. Having said that, I am, I am using a cost expert hash function, so if you were to pick a, uh, an expensive one, I wouldn't be responsible for that build time. Uh, now, about some additional ideas what this might be uh, used for. Uh, the initial one I, I came with, I'm not sure how good it is, probably not very good right now since it would involve production code. I was thinking about uh, APIs. Imagine you have a set of APIs and you might want to simulate some default call for some of them. So such an API could have a do on init call that kind of triggers a so-called self call, if some of them makes, uh, makes any sense. The thing more immediately uh, interesting in my mind would be functions that uh, include their own unit test inside the function body not somewhere else. You could if def such code, which was, would obviously use do on init, and, the, and would include uh, calls to this function. Obviously, those would not be recursive calls. Um, yep, I think this is an interesting uh, use case. So, live long and prosper. Thank you. Questions, comments? Yes. <coughs> no, looks, um, mostly my experience with parameters. You don't mm -hmm. print everything to kill. You print. We have error and error number. Okay. As I've said, internally in our code base, I did uh, implement uh, support for parameters. Uh, I, I, we don't have time here, and I didn't have time to prepare a uh, public presentation with all of that. Uh, <coughs> generally, what we actually have are our log um, macros um, refer to a variadic uh, function, which is able to determine variadically, you know, by the size of the parameter pack, how many parameters I have, and then I. Produ I'll produce logs which include some delimiters with runtime values. I can build a parser on top of that. So what I'm actually encoding, my actual log string that I'm encoding are uh, printf format strings, more or less. So um, an, an actual um, encoded string in our case would be a string that in case you have parameters, you have percent something, percent something, and so on. And then I can uh, scan those back. It's not exactly scan f, but I can reverse the process and produce uh, the original values. The obviously, runtime values are not uh, encoded in any way, uh, but we we do have the full uh, information there. <coughs> what about uh, several modules, like dlets? 
Okay, so the one thing I don't have on this uh, computer, I have a nice demo, which I hope to show uh, next week at CPPCon. Uh, the <coughs> what I'm showing in the demo is that I have, I have two projects. I have one of them is the uh, production code, which includes whatever code which it, it is being invoked and produces logs. The other one is a decoder. Now inside the decoder, I can add any CPP files I choose to. No one is actually invoking them. But the moment I've added such a CPP file to, a, uh, uh, to the decoder project, it's now able to recognize its, its hashes. And if you parse a log file that was produced by that CPP file, it's able to reverse the process and, uh, and decipher those logs. Does this answer a question, or was it a bit different? It's uh, not in every environment it's possible, but I understand your approach. Uh, as I said, GCC might be uh, problematic, although, as I saw, a kind of solution has been uh, found. No, I, I uh, mean, I'm talking about when you have different repositories for every event, it will be hard to clean every code. The, the one, well, it's your source code. You need the decoder tool to compile your source code, which, you ch which has those long entries. That's the requirement here. So the next question, I was thinking that maybe <coughs> when you compile your production code, at the, same, at the same time, to run your decoder, which will generate the dictionary as a text file. In this case, when you get log, you just give to this log the set of dictionaries you created during compilation, and then you convert it to text. In this case, the person who is doubling support who gets the log. He doesn't need uh, access to your all your code base. He just needs the a set of dictionaries you generated during uh, your production compilation. Yes, but the dictionary is the, the decoder tool. All the strings are in its memory. The decoder tool is the dictionary. I don't need any dictionary file. You have, if you have a CI process which produces the production binaries, you're going to produce a decoder tool together with it. You have them both together from the same version, and you're done. But I, I still don't have an actual log at this time. You don't need to have them. You have the decoder tool. You're going to produce logs whenever, perhaps at uh, client sites. And you have the decoder tool that's able to uh, decipher them. I have uh, my production code, I compile it and deliver it uh, to customers. Mm -hmm. Customers fill a bug report, collect the log, and send it to support. Support person doesn't have to test my code. Support person works in your company. Should they should have your decoder tool. They have a decoder tool, but they don't have access to the source code. They don't need to. You need the source code when you are building the decoder tool. The decoder tool, tool is an executable. Once you have it, you have it. OK. Any other questions? Thank you.